Okay, so um, today I want to talk about uh, this result of existence of Fermi-Marie Granger method of all the operations. Yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about uh, this result of existence of minimal Lagrangian maps and how to prove it using uh, anti acetal geometry. So yesterday, what we have seen was this Gauss map construction, which associates to a, a, a space-like surface. Goes from a space like surface in ADS3 to basically some, some subset of H2 times H2 surface in H2. And this is the construction that we want to use. So let me start by the definition of minimal Lagrangian map. So um, the notation, yeah, so we take a diffeomorphism. We consider diffeomorphisms of H2. H2 to H2 is minimal Lagrangian. If, well, there's two conditions. It is area preserving. And the graph of, of E, which lives in a product, is minimal. So what does, what does minimal mean? Um, Here, uh, it's a manifold uh, I want to use sigma as a manifold, let's say well n inside of a Riemannian manifold M is minimal. If when we do a compactly supported variation, then the derivative of the area is, the zero, is zero. So here's the picture. So this is our sum manifold. And we take a, a perturbation which is supported in a compact set. Okay, so we call this NT. So the derivative, the condition is the derivative times zero of the area of NT intersected K uh, is zero for every uh, compactly supported variation. Variation NT of N is supporting K. Okay? So this is a the SM manifold itself is a critical point for the area along a compactly supported variation. We take compactly supported variation because the manifold might be, infi might be infinite area, but still makes sense. Uh, and this definition actually makes sense also in a Lorentzian manifold, we will use it. So if the manifold is Lorentzian, we do the same definition, but such a thing will be called maximal instead of minimal. Uh, and we require, moreover, that n is space-like. In this case, it's called uh, maximal because typically this is going to be a maximum of the area instead of minimal. But it's not very important for the purpose of the talk. But in Hermannian manifold, these things, they say typically, but not always, minimize area. But in Lorentzian manifold, they tend to maximize. On the other hand, this is not very important. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, just a remark here. 
is that this condition here is actually equivalent to the fact that the graph of phi is Lagrangian. In, in the product, we respect to the symplectic form, which is the pullback of the area form of H on the first component minus the pullback of the area form of H on the second component. So, so this symplectic form being identically zero on the graph of phi is exactly the same thing as phi preserving area. So minimal Lagrangian map is such that the map is, the graph is minimal Lagrangian. So the theorem, this is the theorem I want to prove, which is essentially due to Bolsante Schlenker, although you don't write it in this generality, but the argument can, can be pushed a little bit further. So given any orientation preserving homeomorphism of the circle, say small phi from RP1 to RP1, there exists a unique minimal Lagrange extension. from H2 to H2. So actually, this phi is, is a diffeomorphism by definition. So actually, phi will be smooth on H2 and continuous up to the boundary on H2 bar. And so the restriction to RP1 will be equal to phi. It is smooth in the interior, only extend continuously to the boundary. So this. The, the, the boundary morphism can just be a, uh, the boundary data can just be a homomorphism, just continuous, with continuous inverse and no more assumption on the regularity. Uh, okay, just some remarks. This theorem. The first remark is just a silly example. So if phi is, let's say, the restriction to RP1 of an element of PSL2R. So we consider PSL2R as the isometry group of H2. Then the extension is A. So uh, if we start with an element, a Mobius transformation, so an element of PSL2R on the boundary, then the extension is the, is the isometry. So in other words, is an isometry. Of H2. It's actually, there's actually more than that. So, this, this is what is called conformally natural extension, meaning that if we now take uh, uh, AB in PSL2R and we give ourselves any orientation preserving homomorphism of the boundary, the extension. Of, um, of what of a phi b minus one is a capital phi b minus one. If we compose the boundary data with elements of PSL2R, then the extension is actually composed, let's say, an element of PSL2R. This is what is called conformally natural. This is easy to check that, of course. Um, this condition is, is invariant by isometries, basically. So it's clear that if phi is an extension of, of small phi, then this one is an extension. And by uniqueness, it will be the only one a posteriori. Uh, and just a um, final small remark is that if phi is minimal Lagrangian, uh, so too is phi minus 1. So the inverse of a minimal Lagrangian map is minimal Lagrangian which is easily see from the definition because basically the graph of taking the graph of the inverse is the same as exchanging the two factors and this preserves 
uh, this x by a isometry simply serves the, the symplectic form, so clearly the graph of the inverse is also minimal Lagrangian. And why I make this remark is that, uh, remember we have yesterday have discussed how this theorem actually implies the existence of certain maps of the minimal Lagrangian map in the quotient uh, hyperbolic surfaces and people in technical theory have been using uh, some certain classes of maps to produce distances in technical space, so to, to cook up certain distances in technical space. But sometimes, and actually often, it happens that these distances are asymmetric because basically going from here to here is not really the same as going from here to here. So there are classes of maps that are not, that are not symmetric. And why I make this remark is that, on the other hand, the minimal Lagrangian maps are, behave well under taking inverses. So whatever, whatever quantity you hook up on taking mirror space using minimal Lagrangian maps will be symmetric. If you switch the role of the two of the two surfaces, it will give the same quantity. Of course, it, 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 I don't know of any distance that can be built on technical space using minimal Lagrangian maps, but you if you have any idea of a quantity that satisfies a triangular inequality, I'll be very happy to know. Um, because then it will be automatically symmetric. So the proof will be based on uh, um, on a theorem of existence of uh, maximal surfaces. So here's the theorem that um, I'll, okay, I'll tell you later, uh, let's say theorem prime. So let lambda, so this, now we go to anti-decitor geometry. And the thing is that we want to, we want to use some surfaces in anti-decitor space, namely maximal surfaces, to construct minimal Lagrangian maps via Gauss map construction. So we take a subset of anti theta space, homeomorphic to, the, to uh, a circle, so S1, satisfying the following condition. I will give you the condition. This condition star is that for whenever we take three points, x, y, z, in uh, lambda, okay, and we take their span, so remember this lambda is a subset of the boundary of ADS3, which is the projectivization uh, of the Nile cone. So we can consider these as lines. These are basically lines, null lines actually, in R4, okay? Uh, whenever we take these three pairwise, the instinct, their span does not contain a negative definite to plane. Negative definite uh, plane. I will explain this condition holistically mean. Uh, if this condition is satisfied, then the theorem that tells us the existence of a maximal surface. There exists a unique maximal surface. Maximally implicitly means a space like for me in ADS3 such that the asymptotic boundary is the given subset lambda. Say sigma boundary at infinity is equal to lambda. So here's a picture. Remember, we have this picture of anti decitor space. I'll take colors. We take a, a a subset of the boundary, which is topologically a circle, which lives in this boundary torus, a theorem tells us that we can find a unique sort of canonical maximal surface inside, which has this boundary. And let me, 
tell you graphically what this condition means. So again, we have a curve. So a typical, uh, okay, we take three points, one, two, and three. What we're doing, we take their span in R4, which is a, a, a vector subspace. And then when we intersect again, so a prototypical situation is that when we take the span and we intersect again with uh, ADS3, we have a copy of H2, okay? So this is the typical situation. is that x plus y plus z, when we take the intersection with ADS3, is a copy of H2. It's isometric to H2. This condition is slightly weaker in the sense that this, this, play, this, this, this plane that we obtain when taking the intersection has the right to become the generate, but it doesn't have the right to contain a, a time-like direction. So that's the idea. Um, good. So this theorem, how can I write this? So actually theorem primes, theorem prime holds in more general settings. So it holds for, for ADSN, actually, which was initially proved by Bonsante Schlenker. But again, they don't really prove it in this general. So actually, you don't really need uh, this dimension here. You can make, uh, you can say the same theorem for a hypersurface, so you can take here ADS n, here you take a sphere of dimension n minus two, and you look for a hypersurface, and the condition is exactly the same on triple of points. Uh, they proved it, but with a stronger assumption than assumption star, uh, and then Enrico Trebeschi proved it in the full generality. Uh, it also holds in H2n, which I didn't define, but it's the pseudo-hyperbolic space uh, of signature 2n by Laboritulis Wolf. So now for surfaces, so two dimensional space X are manifolds here, 2020, and it actually holds for HPQ, so for P dimensional space like some manifolds in HPQ, so it's always maximal space like dimension by my recent result with Smith and Tulis. Uh, and all of them basically recover the situation that we have here as a particular case. Uh, that, that, that one is the one that we need to, for the application stack in your theory. And uh, just a side remark, uh, that actually this condition star is sufficient by the theorem, but also necessary. So it's, this, is basic, this theorem is actually Niffen only if. Uh, excellent. Any question? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. I, I mean, I haven't defined, but the thing that you do is uh, you take. Uh, so, what is HPQ? You take the points. Such that now what, what you what you do x is in is in R uh, let's say p plus q plus one and you take the points the quadratic form is a p uh, q plus one quadratic form is minus one modulo plus or minus the identity and then you do exactly the same thing here the boundary is the projectivization of those where this is zero and you can give the same definitions this is this is a space of sectional curvature minus one, uh, signature PQ, and then this thing makes sense actually, in, uh, this definition makes sense, and then the theorem holds for a p-dimensional 
phase like some manifold, which is maximum. Yeah, it's, uh, so, okay. Here you need uh, S E minus one, and then some manifold for dimension P. Uh, any other question? No, no, you really take uh, three, three points. The condition is always a condition on triple points. Excellent. So let me give an outline of the proof. Uh, yeah, probably I forgot to say actually unique complete. Let's say. In in, to have this theorem in the full generality, I need to assume that it's complete, actually, that the induced metric is complete. It's a technical point. Um, okay, so outline of the proof of, of, of our main theorem that we want to talk about, the one above here, okay, which will rely on, uh, on this existence result. So the step one is by, well, apply what I call the theorem prime to a special case, to lambda, which is the graph of our phi, which leaves uh, in the boundary of ADS3, which, remember, is the product of two copies of RP1. Okay. So it makes sense to take, uh, to take the graph. It's a subset of the boundary, and we need to check. So what we need to do is to check star always so that we can actually apply, apply, apply this theory. Okay? Um, and now, once we have this maximal surface, we want to apply the Gauss map machinery. So, that we talked about yesterday. So now we have, uh, we have these two maps, GL sigma and GR sigma, called Gauss maps, so from sigma to H2. And second step is show that GL sigma and GR sigma are uh, immersions. Immersion. Uh, so imme so he, he, now we have a two dimension two dimensional uh, manifold. So actually local isomorphisms, let's say. Okay. So we'll have uh, basically a immerse. This gives us a immerse surface in H two times H two. And we want to, where we want to go is to see that this immer surface is the graph of the minimal Lagrangian map we're looking for. Um, so, for our theorem, we need to find the minimal Lagrangian map, and we need to check that it extends to the correct map on the boundary. So, the third step that one does, and if if one wants to do things in the right order, is to show that these two maps. G L sigma and G R sigma, again they go from sigma to H two, extend to the maps going uh, from uh, where from the boundary of sigma. So they extend to the boundary. So they, so they go from the boundary to infinity of sigma, which is lambda by construction, to the boundary infinity of H two which is RP1, and they extend to, to the projection. So they extend to the maps X, mapping X, Y to X, and X, Y to Y, respectively. Okay. This is actually a key point on, in order to have the extension property. And once we have, once one has proved, we won't prove everything, but once one has proved all this, actually two plus three together will imply that these two maps are global differ. Why? Well, it's because from point two we know they are local diffeomorphisms, and point three are telling us that they are proper. 
Now, a local diffeomorphism, which is proper, uh, is surjective, it is a covering map. And uh, it's, now it's a covering map to H2, which is simply connected, so the only possibility is that it is actually diffeomorphism. And so once one knows that they are diffeomorphisms, then with a good shape, we can take uh, so G, G sigma or sigma, which is, well, the, um, yeah, so the image, uh, the image of, of the, of the, of the full Gauss map, maybe, maybe the pair of, of two Gauss maps is now a subset of H2 times H2. Okay, and we need to check that this uh, is a minimal Lagrangian submanifold. So this will imply that phi is the, the composition of the two. So the map such that the, this thing is the graph. So G R sigma composed G. Oh. is a minimal Lagrangian map, a definition, and uh, by three, once we have done all this, by three, we have that phi on the boundary, p one is equal to small phi, because these two maps extend. So here we have actually y is by construction is phi of x, because we have started, uh, we have started by construction by taking lambda to be the graph of phi, and therefore, first map extends to the projection of the first factor, the second one to projection of the first factor, when we compose the inverse, we get exactly what we want. This, okay. So this is the outline. Um, I'm supposed to stop at 11, right? Or 11 something, we started slightly late, maybe? Okay. So I'll, yeah, I'll give, let me try to keep this board uh, forever and ever. I'll give some ingredients of these of this steps, probably just some of the steps. Okay, let me start by one, which is an easy exercise. It's good to start with the, with the easy things. So we want to show, want to show that uh, for, say, x, so we take a triple, we, we need to check, what we have to do is here in the step one is to check that this condition holds so that we can apply the theorem, okay? So we want for a triple of points, which, so I take a triple of points, which are in the boundary of ADS3, which is, again, sorry for repeating myself many times, but this is the product of the copies of RP1. Uh, X1, X2, of course, Y equal to Y1, Y2, and Z equal to Z1, Z2. So what we want to show is that X plus Y that Z, actually in this situation, we will really be in the prototypical, uh, will really be in the prototypical situation. So actually I will not only check the star holds, but the slightly uh, better, uh, stronger form, we really check that this intersection ADS3 is a copy of H2. Okay, so condition holds and actually in the even stronger situation that actually this has signature 2, 1. So we, this is what we're showing, this is what holds. And this is very easy because uh, up to the action of PSL2R times PSL2R, hmm, 
we can reduce, we can assume, after applying an isometry, we can assume these three points are our, our, are our favorite points because PSL2R acts simply transitively on oriented triple points on, on RP1. So we have X1, Y1, and Z1 on the left. After applying an element of PSL2R, we can assume that X1 is, is uh, let's say, uh, 1, 0. Y1 is... 1 and Z1 is 1 1 so these are let's say 0 1 and infinity in RP1 and we can do the same on the right so actually we can assume that also X2 is this Y2 is this and Z2 is this okay now the computation is much easier because you remember what was the identification between the boundary of ADS3 and RP1 times RP1 this was the thing, but this identification here, on the left we have rank, the projectivization of rank one matrices. And on the right we have RP1 times RP1. So this was the map sending A matrix to its image and its kernel. But the only thing we have to, to do is write down the rank one matrices that have kernel and image equal to this uh, and, and the other ones. So what we find, uh, so here, who is this matrix? This matrix, the one that has kernel and image equal to this one is, I think, this, right? Yes. The one that has kernel and uh, image equal to this is going to be this one. And the one that has kernel and image equal to this is, is this one. Of course, up to, up to factors. Okay. So what is the span of these three matrices the, uh, in the space of two by two matrices? Well, this is the space of traceless matrix. Three of them are traceless, and traceless matrices are three-dimensional subspace. So this is, uh, these are the uh, uh, A, such that the trace of A is equal to zero. And we have already seen that these are actually ordered to elliptic elements. And this is a copy of H2. The map was just a fixed point map. We have already seen this. So oh, good, you're in good shape. Any question? Well, because I need, uh, it's a good point. I need, uh, the, the, so I, I start with a triple in lambda, which is a graph of phi. So this is telling me that if I take three different points here, x1, y1, and z1, then they are mapped to three different points here, because this is the graph. And if x1, x2, sorry, x1, y1, and z1 are positively oriented, also the images are positively oriented, because this is orientation preserving. So I have really used the, yeah, in, in this reduction, everything is, is in this reduction here, actually. And then it's just the computation. Okay, cool. I think I will try to talk a little bit about items two and four in the remaining time. I need a little bit, a little bit of uh, uh, surface theory. In ADS3. So as usual, we have sigma, a space like some manifold, space like surface. Let me remind you, we have already seen this in several mini courses. Let me remind you what are the geometric invariants of, of this embedded subsurface, we have the first fundamental form. which is just the, let's say, the restriction of the ambient metric 
by the inclusion map. So it's a Riemannian metric on sigma. And then there is the shape of it. I'll try to be consistent with the with, uh, with uh, mini course of Mohammad, and I call it A, maybe a little curly, just to make the difference, mark the difference with the matrices. So it's a shape operator, which is just the derivative of the normal vector. So this is an endomorphism, uh, endomorphism. No, because in a Lorentz, so why do you put a minus? It's because you want, you wanted the second fundamental form. So the fact everyone agrees on the second fundamental form, right? And then you want the second fundamental form to be equal to the first fundamental form with A, X, Y, right? Uh, a V, W. And uh, when you do this, you, you need to basically use the compatibility with the metric and use that N, N is plus one. But here, N, N is minus one. So this changes a sign. This raises every ambiguity, actually. There's no, I mean, anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. Why it doesn't matter? Because we consider maximal surfaces. So sigma is maximal. This is a fact. Sigma is maximal if and only if the trace of B is identically zero. The trace of A, sorry. This is, I, I told you, that. I'll try to use A, but I'm not sure, I can't promise. So it doesn't matter on the sign, actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then I also need to use what I call J. So J is the almost complex structure. Structure of I. But it is also an endomorphism. It is also an endomorphism at the tangent space. It satisfies J squared equal to minus the identity. So it's basically the rotation by 90 degrees after you have chosen a, a, an orientation. I don't want to really deal with the orientation. OK. Now what I will use is a formula. It's an important formula. The important formula is for the pullback of the metric of, of, so H is the metric on H2. And I take the pullback by the left and right Gauss maps. Okay, and then here there is an important formula which, I mean, requires some, some computation, but is very explicit. So we, if you pull back these the metric of H by this map, what you get is the first fundamental form. That, uh, however, you have to twist with uh, an endomorphism of the tangent space, which is the identity minus JA. Identity minus JA. And here is the same, but with a plus. Why is it so cool? Uh, let me check if I have any, anything else to say. Why it is so cool? Well, uh, first, it has some direct consequence. So we see that GL, maybe I should, I should have written this here. So here we see that GL sigma is an immersion at P, a local diffeo as, as you want, immersion at P, if and only if this thing is invertible, right? We want the pullback metric to be non-degenerate. Uh, so if and only if, is the determinant of the identity minus JA doesn't vanish, and the other one is an immersion 
if and only if now the determinant of the other one is different from zero. But easy computation shows the determinant of the identity plus or minus JA is actually, so there's a formula here. You take the determinant of the first guy, which is one, and then you take the determinant of the second guy, which is doesn't matter if plus or minus, this is the determinant of JA, by determinant of J is one because it squares to the minus the identity. Uh, and therefore, um, it's just the determinant of A. And then there is a, an element which should be the trace of, well, the trace of this, and the trace of this vanishes because basically this guy is similar. This is a linear computation, but the trace vanishes. So we have this, and this is equal to minus the curvature of the metric by the Gauss formula, or the Gauss equation. The Gauss equation in the Gauss equation in ADS three, I write here and then I'll, 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 I'll erase the curvature is minus one because the ambient curvature is minus one, and then you have the determinant of a. But since we are in a Lorentzian manifold and the surface space, like we need to put a minus and not a, not a plus, as you usually do in a, in a, in hyperbolic uh, space. Okay, so we see here that GL sigma at P is, yeah, um, is an immersion. Oh, let's forget about P. Is an immersion if and only if the other one is an immersion. Is an immersion if and only if the curvature never vanishes. Okay, like that I had stated yesterday. Uh, and incidentally, actually this shows that G, the total Gauss map, which is the composition of the two, is always an immersion. Because uh, if you have a vector that fails to be an immersion for this one, it must be in the kernel of the differential of both, but the kernel of the uh, kernel of identity minus JA intersected the kernel identity plus JA is the null vector. Not very important, but it's just a side remark, actually. The total Gauss map is always an immersion, but each, each one doesn't need to be an immersion. We need the condition that the curvature doesn't vanish. So for point two, point two, we need to show this condition. And this comes from a maximum principle. Uh, so there's a little function to consider here. We take a function f, which we define to be one half. So let's say that a is an endomorphism, which has zero trace. So it's conjugate to a uh, it's, it's always diagonalizable, so it's conjugate to something which is k minus k when we diagonalize. Let's say k is greater or equal to zero. And what we, we take this function, which is one half the logarithm of k. Okay. So this function is not de defined everywhere because if k is zero, this isn't defined. But if k is zero, by this equation, the curvature is minus one. So we are, if, if k is identically zero, it, mean, it means a is identically zero, it means the curvature is minus one, we are happy. So away from the zeros, we have an equation which is satisfied, which is that the, 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 the Laplacian of f is equal to the curvature of sigma. This is again the, La, the Laplacian, Laplace Beltrami operator for, for the first fundamental form. And this is a great equation. Uh, so to, to apply maximum principle. So um, imagine that we want to show, so we want to show, we want to show that k sigma is always non-negative. So we suppose uh, that uh, it's not the case. Uh, so, okay, here the, the surface is not compact, but let's, let's for a second uh, pretend that 
uh, that this function f as a maximum. And so the, at the maximum point, so this is actually the maximum of this function is also the maximum of the curvature. Uh, so you, is, you immediately see that basically at the maximum point, this must be negative. So this must, this must be non-positive. So this must be non-positive. You want to do in general, you need to do some maximum principle at infinity, which is trickier, but it still works. So maximum principle tells us that the, cur the curvature is less than or equal to zero. And actually the strong maximum principle tells us that if the curvature, if there exists a P such that the curvature is zero, then the curvature is identically zero, which is, so this is the case we still need to exclude. We know it's non-positive. We want to see that it's strictly negative now because we want non-zero. But the strong maximum principle tells us that if, if zero is achieved at one point, then it's exactly identically zero. And this is actually equivalent. Uh, so one can study the surfaces that are obtained in this way. And one sees that the boundary at infinity of sigma in that case uh, is, is not even a graph. So it's a curve. Here I'm drawing the torus. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a curve that on the, on the torus looks like that. So it's, um, yeah, this is, this is, this is the torus. So in particular, it's not a graph. Okay. So since we have started with a graph, uh, the, the curvature cannot be zero at any point. So we are here. So, uh, so we are good. We, we have checked that both Gauss maps are immersions, which was our second point. Uh, I'm almost over time, but we started slightly late. So let me finish with one more computation. I just totally skip. Yeah, no, but okay. Uh, uh, doesn't matter. I, I'll, probably I'll take actually five minutes, but if it's less, it's even better. I'll totally skip uh, item three. Let me just give some hints of item four, which are based on, on the same, uh, on the same uh, formula up there for, for, for the pullback matrix. Uh, so another consequence of this, of, this, of this formula that I like a lot is that, well, basically, let's do the following thing. We want item four. So let's do the following thing. We do the, uh, the area form of the pullback metric, which is, um, in other words, we pull back the area form of H, okay? By the magic formula, what we get is the determinant identity minus JA uh, times the area form of the first fundamental form. And this, we know this is minus the curvature, which doesn't vanish. And if we do the other one, it's exactly the same. It's the same with the plus. So we again get the same result. So in other words, these, these two maps have the same Jacobian determinant. Since we now know that they are global diffeomorphisms, well, I have hidden under the carpet point three, but anyway, since we know they are global diffeomorphisms and they have the same Jacobian, so the pullback area forms are the same, this shows that the composition is area preserving. So we uh, remember in point four, we want, to, we want to check that this composition here is a minimal Lagrangian map. And this consisted of, of two conditions. One, the map being area preserving, which we have checked. The second thing we, want, we need to show is that the graph of, of, let's say, let's call this phi. The graph of phi is minimal. 
this is a little harder, but let me just say a word for, for the experts. So, so far we actually haven't used that, that the surface was maximal. This is always true. Whenever you have a certain surface and the two maps are, are let's say, local diffeomorphisms, when we can compose, we'll always get something out of preserving, which, by the way, is an obstruction of, to the extent to which this kind of method can be applied in order to construct cert certain extensions. But here, now we really need to use that the surface is maximal. Using that the surface is maximal, one needs a little bit of uh, differential geometry or harmonic maps in particular, and one checks that actually this map here, the, the, the total Gauss map is conformal and harmonic. It's again based on this sort of computation, but it's a little trickier. Uh, you need to know what the harmonic map is in particular. And uh, it's a general fact that a conformal harmonic immersion, because this is always an immersion. Conformal harmonic immersion into a Riemannian manifold has a uh, minimal image. So this is a minimal surface. So this is the other thing that we needed to check in order to verify the minimal Lagrangian condition. Okay, I'll stop here. <laughs>